In today's world, nearly everyone cherishes photographs of family, friends, and special occasions. Photographers and viewers alike do not want the medium to disappear. They have a desire to learn about the subjects captured on the film and to have a sense of belonging. These photographs are able to capture a moment in time, preserving a piece of history. They allow those that were there to travel back in time, and they allow those that were not there to share in the experiences of those that were. During the mid-19th century and early 20th century, stereoscopic views captured nearly every important event. During this period, professionals and amateurs alike developed millions of stereographs. At the height of their popularity in the late 1890s, a stereoscope and views could be found in nearly every middle-class and upper-class household. When viewers looked into the stereoscope, they were transported into the scene, with every detail captured to create a sense of depth and of reality. It was magic. By looking through the stereoscope, it was as if you were there in person. The stereographs were a window in which the viewers were able to see the images as they were. They were considered to be transparent media. The stereoscope is an invention that affords a viewer to examine two images, often photographs, of the same subject matter. The two images are exposed at slightly different angles. When the images are viewed together, side by side, they create an impression of three dimensions bringing life to the subject. The term stereoscope or stereograph is derived from the Latin root word stereo, meaning solid body, scopion, meaning to see, and graph, to scribe or to write. Over the years, stereograph subjects have ranged from great works of art, architecture, fictional narratives, and even to pornography. The concepts of stereoscopy were generally known in the early 19th century. However, no one had been able to invent a device to prove the theories of binocular vision. It was not until 1838 when Sir Charles Wheatstone had published a paper in the British Royal Society to which he demonstrated the brain identifies an object as three-dimensional as a result of each eye experiencing a slightly different view. Wheatstone's reflecting mirror stereoscope was large and awkward to use. It consisted of a pair of mirrors set in the middle of two wooden boards at a 45 degree angle in relation to the viewer's eyes. These mirrors reflected drawings that were mounted to sideboards. Since the Wheatstone stereoscope was created roughly a year before the photographic processes were readily available, he used two similar drawings to demonstrate binocular vision. To help achieve the desired realistic feeling of the images, Wheatstone took the time to add shading and coloring to his drawings. If the drawings had been simple lines, the effects of binocular vision would not have been as strong. Although the Wheatstone stereoscope was larger and less convenient for an average person to use, there was an advantage to its size. It was able to hold larger pieces of artwork. Salvador Dali had used the concepts of the reflecting mirror stereoscope to create pieces of stereoscopic paintings, such as Dali's foot. Wheatstone had a scientific rival, David Brewster. It was during the early 19th century that there was a period of rapid technological change as a result of optical discoveries. While Brewster did not claim he had invented the stereoscope, he had expressed the idea of binocular perception was known to every student of vision. Brewster claimed that four years prior to Wheatstone's reflecting mirror stereoscope, that Elliot, a mathematics teacher, had constructed a wooden stereoscope without lenses or mirrors, an instrument for uniting two dissimilar pictures to view landscape transparencies. Although Brewster was interested in disproving Wheatstone's contributions to the stereoscope, he himself had made large contributions to their advancement. Brewster was responsible for the lenticular stereoscope. The lenticular stereoscope was compact with magnifying lenses to merge daguerreotype photographs together. The lenticular stereoscope has been compared to a pair of binoculars. It is a box-like instrument with two sets of lenses with a hinge shutter to allow placement of the stereo views. It was this stereoscope that Brewster had brought to the Great Exhibition of 1851 in London's Crystal Palace, where Queen Victoria had admired the stereographs and declared herself amused that it created a market for viewers and the graphs. As a result of the notoriety of the stereoscope created by Queen Victoria's praise, there was a surge in popularity, with the public wanting to be able to have a stereoscope in their living rooms. Oliver Wendell Holmes had the desire to create such a stereoscope, available at an economical cost for the masses. It was in 1861 that Holmes had developed his stereoscope and did not patent it. He believed it was important for the stereoscopic technology to continue with advancement. The small handheld size scope and the ease of use made the Holmes stereoscope popular, 
and saw it welcomed into the households of the middle and upper class citizens throughout England and North America. It was Sir Charles Wheatstone's desire to demonstrate binocular depth perception that led to his invention of the stereoscope. Binocular vision occurs in animals which have two eyes located on the front of the head, not the sides. Since human eyes are slightly separated, each eye views the same image from a slightly different angle. Being close together, both the right retina and the left retina absorb plenty of the same information. However, each eye receives information that the other does not. When presented with these discrepancies in the visual cortex, the brain begins to process the differences, blending the two images to form one. This allows the viewer to experience depth perception and to observe the world in three dimensions, in stereoscopic vision. You can confirm this for yourselves. Take a moment to look at the image on the screen. Begin by aligning your nose with the center of the image and placing your thumb several inches in front of your nose. Now close one eye at a time, alternating back and forth. Make sure to take note of the position of the image. Does it change positions as you alternate closing eyes? Notice that the image does change positions from left to right. The brain takes the information from each eye and joins it into a single three-dimensional image located in the middle of both eyes, creating a sense of height, depth, and width. The stereoscope operates in the same fashion as binocular depth perception. The popularized home stereoscope consisted of an oval-shaped casing to cover the eyes with two prismatic lenses and an area for the viewer's nose to fit comfortably in place. There was a long arm that extended from the base of the casing with the part to secure the stereograph to the stereoscope. This component was able to move back and forth along the arm to allow the proximity to be adjusted for each individual user. Furthermore, to ensure both eyes viewed individual images, there was a protrusion from the front of the casing that separated the two lenses. The stereoscope would be held up against the viewer's face with the stereographs in placed in front of the eyes. As the viewer looked at the two slightly different images, the brain blended these images together to create a three-dimensional effect. Stereographs, also known as stereo views or stereograms, were typically images on card mounts. However, they can be found on daguerreotypes, glass negatives, and other processes. The front of the card mount would typically contain the information regarding the captured image on the side or under the image. However, information could be found on the back of the card as well. The stereograph cards would list the publishing company, the photographer, and would provide a detailed description of the stereo view in place of a title. This information would allow the viewers to know the scenes they were experiencing, quite possibly destinations they have never been. Following the Great Exhibition of 1851, millions of homes around the world had purchased a stereoscope. As a result, the production of stereographs had become a worldwide industry. In the 1920s, since stereoscopes permitted only a single person to experience the sensation of three-dimensionality, stereo viewing gatherings were common. Although the stereo views were transparent in nature, they were considered to be hypermedia as well. The stereographs were not only a window into another world, but were highly sought after and collected. It was the viewers' collection processes of the stereo views that created a sense of intense awareness and reveling in the views. The stereographs not only served as an important method of entertainment, they were also a method of education and of virtual travel. Members of this society were able to view stereographs of current events such as parades, social gatherings, and political events like World War I and the American Civil War, and disasters like the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In the 20th and 21st century, the stereographs have been able to serve as a primary source of study for the 19th century's social conventions and cultural values. Furthermore, tourists often collected stereo views as souvenirs during their travels. In this manner, stereo views were similar to captive visites. People would trade views to acquire ones of exotic locations they are not likely to travel to, such as the Pyramid de Giza. In 1939, William Gruber discovered a new use for Kodak's colored 35mm film. He and Harold Graves came together to form the Viewmaster Company to create a reel of seven stereographic images of tourist attractions. Only later in the 1960s did the Viewmaster become a children's toy. The invention of the stereoscope led to a variety of advancements in optical technology. The population was captured by the effects of three-dimensional imaging. Many stereoscopic cameras were invented, allowing photographers to simultaneously capture the two images necessary to create the sense of depth perception. These cameras also led to the invention of the stereopticon, the magic lantern for filmmaking. Although many do not consider them to be stereoscopes requiring two similar images side by side, there is an increase in popularity of daguerreotypes and the invention of anaglyph glasses.
Many stereoscopes use daguerreotypes, however, there is a surge in their individual popularity as they use a photographic process in which the image appears on a mirror-like surface of silver, providing a single image the three-dimensional feeling. Anaglyph glasses, otherwise known as 3D glasses, typically with one red and one blue lens, create a three-dimensional effect for the viewer. The 3D effect is generated by the use of two images overlapping one another and not being viewed side by side as it would be within the stereoscope. Oliver Wendell Holmes described a stereoscope as an instrument which makes surfaces look solid. All pictures in which perspective and light and shade are properly managed have more or less of the effect of solidity, but by this instrument that the effect is so heightened as to produce an appearance of reality which cheats the senses with its seeming truth. It is this truth society yearns to find. The visual space transcend all language barriers, providing the ability to learn from one another. Without the popularity gained during the Victoria era, the stereoscope's three-dimensional imaging would not have contributed to the evolution of photography, film, and much more. As a result of these remediations, living in the 21st century, we can discover the thrill of three-dimensional imaging in the recently viable 3D film, television, and books. If it were not for the stereoscope and stereo views, would these technological advancements have occurred?